and she did a wonderful job on that. And her kitchen was always open and her dining table to people, and I've had many a, a great meal in there with her and Papa. And I enjoyed the fellowship with Papa and her, and, and uh, obviously I knew Mr. Ruffle better than her, but I knew her well too. And I met them in uh, 1969 in uh, Prattville when I lived there, and uh, they were at uh, my brother-in-law's house and it was Archie Adams and several of them. But <clears throat> I miss her, but I'm glad she's where she is. But in all of that, all that good work, you wait till you hear a testimony. I mean, a lot of people think because they do the best they can, do good, or grace believers, or pull out of churches and get into the uh, grace message and all that, or do this or do that, think that that's their salvation. But listen to what she says. It says, My testimony by Jeanette Russell. When my husband Leon Russell came home from overseas during World War II, he told me that he had gotten saved through talking to a fellow soldier he had met. After listening to him, I knew I had never been saved, and so one day I got down by my bed and asked Jesus to save me. For many years I claimed that as my salvation. Then Leon, after hearing the gospel preached by Brother Moore and Many other preachers realized that he wasn't saved and trusted the Lord. After what happened to him, I began to be tro get troubled and had no peace and started to ask the Lord over and over to save me and still no peace. My thoughts were always, I know the gospel and I know I have asked the Lord to save me. So now, so I know I have been, uh, have, to, have to be saved and still no peace. I didn't want to give my testimony because I didn't know which time the Lord had saved me. This has gone on all these years with no peace about it. Then one day recently, my daughter was visiting me, and we were talking about the Lord, and she was telling me about her salvation. I knew she had had a real struggle with her salvation, and she had asked the Lord many times to save her and couldn't find peace. Finally, she gave up and decided that the Lord Jesus, the Lord, didn't, just didn't want to save her. Then one morning at church, her preacher said, You don't have to do anything. Just believe and trust what He hath already done for you, and He will save you. That's what the Bible tells us. Just believe and trust His Word. He, was already, he has already told us in His Word what He had done to save us. When I heard her say that it was like a light bulb went off, and I thought, that's me. I realized that I had been trusting in the fact that I was asking him to save me, and he didn't tell me to ask but to trust, and I was putting my faith in my asking. So right then I gave up on anything I was doing and just trusted him. So now I know I have a Savior. I have a testimony. Are you listening? which is February 14th, 2012. This year, which happens to be Valentine's Day, uh, I told him in a funeral, she deceived you all these years with her works, just like most people do. Most people do works, very good works. And when, when the Bible says there's none good, it's not talking about that they don't do good things and, and do good to people and be good to people and all that. It's not what that's referring to. There's none good. There's none that doeth good. Jesus explained that there was none good but his Father, which was in heaven. Paul explains that there's none that doeth good. And the issue is, again, it has nothing to do with the fact that you don't do good works. It has to do with the fact you can't do enough good works to even get near the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his works. And for her to trust in 2012 has to take the air out of somebody. Might be somebody in here. I don't know. Like I told them in there, I only know one saved person in this room, and it's me. The rest of you on your own. But you can make that decision on your own. And I've asked people, I say, do you confess sins? Yes. There's no peace in that. If you confess over and over, there's no peace, or you'd know you're all, they're already gone. They really don't believe First John 1, 9. Do you know what he said in 1 John 1, 9 he would do? 
If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from what? How much? And that's talking to Israel. Had they done some things that were unrighteous to the Lord? Yes. Cleanse you from all unrighteous. God, through the Apostle Paul, never told us to confess sins. No peace in it. He never told us to walk an aisle. There's no peace in it. Why? Nine times out of ten in the future years of your life, you'll rededicate. I uh, put the emphasis on re. Rededicate. So there's no peace there. Uh, there's no peace in turning from your sins. Why? Because they show up again. There's no peace in that. So what is there peace in? Well, that's what we want to study today. Romans chapter 5. All right, in Romans chapter 5, again, we want to talk about peace. Verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The word peace here has to do with unity. It has to do with concord, uh, I was telling Harold about this word concord. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, the Apostle Paul in his messages tell us to avoid certain people, to purge from certain people, to watch certain things, keep the right doctrine, don't separate from it, and so 2 Corinthians 6, 14, he said, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So the whole next few verses is going to be about a believer versus an unbeliever. That's what it's going to be about. It's going to be what the believer should do about the unbeliever. You with me? Now, the Bible says, and I believe it's in Amos, How can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh, verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, the body of Christ does not yoke unbelievers together. There's no unbeliever in the body of Christ. Why? You can't get in the body of Christ. You have to be placed in the body of Christ by the Spirit. By one Spirit, we all baptize into one body. Baptism has nothing to do with water. It's a placement. It's put in there. Once you trust the gospel of Christ, you believe it, you trust it. You trust what you believe. You you're not going to go any farther with it. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You're not going to go any farther with your belief. You trust what you believe. You understand? That means you're done with it. You're, you're, you're not going to worry about it anymore. You're satisfied because God's satisfied. Okay? He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what? Fellowship hath righteous with unrighteous. So it is a religious terminology here of fellowship. Isn't that what's used in the churches? Now, if you get baptized in a church, can anybody in that church get baptized? Is that their activity? Can they lie about what they believe or trust and get baptized because the preacher can't read their minds? Okay? So if you get baptized in a church, you may be yoking yourself with who? Okay? I mean, it's quite obvious. A lot of people use this for marriage. It is not about a marriage. Because if you read in the Corinthian letter about marriage, he says, can an unbeliever help a, un a believer? A believer help an unbeliever? Yes. And so forth and so on. But this is strictly about fellowship. Now, let's read on. What righteousness, uh, fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness. So is a believer righteous? Is an unbeliever unrighteous? Okay, let's read on. What communion hath light with darkness? Again, a religious word. Communion. What communion hath light with? One will overcome the other. You understand? They won't be equal. They won't, they won't do fruit. One will overcome the other. Dark or light. If you got enough light, it will overcome darkness. But if you don't have enough darkness, it will overcome light. You know, they used to do that light bulb and they'd put a strip of tape on it, and, and they keep taping it until there wasn't any light admitting from it, and that would be, they used to use it for works of a, an, of a person. 
I ain't doing that right now. Now watch. Verse 15. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Now, who's Belial? Turn with me to 1 Samuel. Chapter 12. I apologize. It's 2. I don't know why I said 12. 1 Samuel 2. And I ain't got time to read this and go through it, but Eli is the high priest of Israel. He has sons. Now, if you want to understand Belial, here it is. Any son of Eli is the son of who? That was an easy question. Any son of Eli is the son of who? Yeah, amen, praise God. I didn't see any of you listening. <laughs> All right. Verse 12, 1 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Levi were sons of Belial. Why? They knew not the Lord. The word Belial is not Satan. It has to do with a, a worthless son. Now watch. Turn to Romans 5. In Romans 5, and get 1 Corinthians 6. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 6 first, verse 19. What? You know, question. What? Know ye not you're the body, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not uh, your own. In other words, you, uh, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 20, for you're bought with a price. Okay? It took a price to buy you from being Belial. And the reason I'm saying that, let's read on. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Who owns the world now? You see, the God of this world finagled around and caused the fall of the world. Wherefore, is by one man sin in the world. God bought the world back. Did he not reconcile the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses? Now, if God is not imputing trespasses, wouldn't you say that was peace if you believed that? But instead, people are confessing their sins. Then they don't believe that God actually bought them unless they clean up their act. Now watch, Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were without, yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the what? Ungodly. Ungodly. So was he dying for the good guy? There was none good. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even to dare, dare to die. But God, and, and you understand there are men in the service that have died for their buddies because they were good to each other and they were the brotherhood, the brotherhood of service. And, uh, and they, if the guy got killed, he said, man, he was a good guy. And a lot of guys would throw themselves on a grenade to save their buddies because they cared for them. They probably wouldn't do that if the man was shooting at them or had cut them, or hated them, or been stealing from them, and they hated him, they would have probably said, Bah! Well, look what verse 7 says. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. 
We weren't good, guys. We were sinners. In verse 6, we were ungodly. Okay? Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Why will God save you from wrath? Through Him. Okay? Through Him. What did Him do? He shed His blood for ungodly sinners. They were not good. They all hated Him. They all were going away from Him. All our righteousness were as filthy rag. There was none that doeth good. There was none seeking Him. And yet He's still dying for us. Now watch. Verse 10. For if when we were what? Do you really want to die for your enemy? What do you want to do to your enemy? You kill him. And he died while we were yet what? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. All right, if the Lord is alive, what does verse 10 tell you? Read the end of the verse. We shall be saved by His life. Now, if you take ungodly, how does that word start? You? How about sinners, first word? Yes. How about enemies, first word? Now, what does that spell? God cannot use you unless Jesus does it. Because you were under another man's sin. But God reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world. God made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Now, folks, you are going to meditate on the fact that God made his son to where he didn't want to look at him. He don't want to look at you the way you are. If Christ be not in you, you're none of his. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. I laugh at their derision. Think of what he did. He made Jesus Christ become you and wouldn't look at him. Because if he turned his back on him, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And then the faith of Jesus Christ said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the second, the very moment that God is totally satisfied, he raised his son for giving you. Now, if that ain't peace, I don't know what to do. Now, let's look at some things. Romans 10. I can tell you all the things about you. You were ungodly, sinner, and enemy. You didn't seek God. You're not righteous. You don't understand. That's all fine and dandy. That's just telling you what you is. But what is the salvation is the gospel of peace. Now, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, like I've told many times, if that was all the only verse you had, it would have saved Mrs. Russell. Hello? If that's the only verse you have, that will save Mrs. Russell all those years. What did she say she did? She got down and called on the name of the Lord to save her. But she always thought, I got down and called on the name of Him to save me. Are you listening? She's putting stock in the fact that she called on the Lord to save her. You're all looking at me like, whoa, what happened here? Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that's the only verse you got, what must we do? Okay. 
And how then shall we they call on him in whom they've not believed? Read on. And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay. Hold your finger there just a minute. Go to Acts chapter 2. Let's see what Peter has to say. Remember, that's the only verse you got. We better get on with it, hadn't we? We better get called on the name of the Lord. In Acts 2, Peter is preaching to the Jews, men of Judea, uh, all the house of Israel, you men of Israel. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sounds like Paul's message, don't it? Okay? Problem is, is Peter's not our preacher. But it ain't about Peter's preaching. It's about verse 19. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I would say you'd be looking for the Lord if that stuff started happening. Wouldn't you? Was that happening to you when you called on the name of the Lord? I doubt it. Go back to Acts uh, or Romans 10. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Now watch this. Verse 14, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? You see that? 15, How shall they preach except they be sent? Hold there. Go to John 13. God didn't call me to go to that funeral the other day and preach the kingdom message. God called me years ago to preach the gospel of Christ. And I hopefully haven't quit that. I hope I don't. And if I get seen, I'll shoot me. Thank God He seals people in our insanities. John 13, 20. Barely, barely. Or as the joke said, be Riley, be Riley. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me uh, receiveth him that sent me. All right? If I go in reverse order, who sent Jesus? God the Father. Okay? Who did Jesus send in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Matthew 10. He sent them forth, did he not? The twelve apostles. What gospel would they have? gospel of the kingdom. After Jesus died, what gospel did Peter have? gospel of the circumcision. Are you with me? That's scripture. All you got to do is read the directions. Okay, now watch this. Then whosoever Jesus sends, whoever they go to have to receive what they say to receive Jesus to receive God. Is that not what the verse says? Okay. Matthew 10, just because we said it, we're going to read it. Matthew 10. Matter of fact, let's go back even farther. Let's go to, well, go to Matthew 10. No, 15, and then we're going to go backwards. Matthew 15. Now, people follow the red words of Christ, and you all know this, but there might be somebody here who's not familiar with it. The red words of Christ. Oh, I've run into that many times. I, I follow the red words of Christ, and I said, you're a liar. You do not. Say, we're not a very nice person. God didn't save me because I was nice. He saved me because I'm an ungodly sinner and an enemy. If I was a nice person, whatever. Matthew 15. A woman comes to Jesus of Canaan. She wants mercy. That's in verse 22. She calls him Lord in verse 22. Verse 23, what did he do? 
He didn't answer a word. Now, folks, if you're following the evangelism of Jesus, that don't sound good, does it? This woman is truly asking for mercy, and he didn't answer a word. It's like, then he had a purpose, did he not? A purpose being sin of God, did he not have a purpose? Was that purpose for that woman of Canaan? Nope. In verse 23, he answered not a word. And his disciples came and said, Lady, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. My God, if they have no mercy, she's crying after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then guess what the red words are for? Lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ain't no doubt about it. Okay? So, go with me to Acts chapter 26. Did I tell you Matthew 10? I apologize. Matthew 10. I, I will read that before I go. Matthew 10. And it, this is the absolute. We've, now, we, have we got the fact that Jesus come from the Father? Uh, did He just send Him down here and say, do whatever you want? He had two purposes. One, He sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Two, He's taught them the words because He's going to go away. Matthew 16, uh, he, he said, who do you say I am? And thou say thou art Christ. You know, Peter says this. And then he begins to tell them, he said, from that time forth, he begins to show them how he would be delivered up, suffer many things, the chief priests and elders would be crucified and rise again the third day. And Peter said, no. So the crucifixion is not Peter's message. Yes or no? My God, if it was his message, he would say, praise God, hallelujah. You're telling me what's going to happen, praise God. No, he said, no, Lord, that won't be. He said, get behind me then, Satan. Now watch, Matthew 10, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, which are all apostles, but not all disciples, are apostles. And he said, now verse 2, he names them. And then in verse 5, the tw these twelve Jesus sent forth. What? What did he do to them? He sent them forth. And commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, any not, but rather go to. Then he's telling them to do what he was sent to do. There ain't no doubt about it. There are preachers that they couldn't miss this unless they wanted to. And they do. Because this is leaving us in the dark, folks. This is leaving us in this room in the dark. We can't follow Jesus. We can't follow the disciples, the apostles. We got problems, folks, in this message. Now, go to Acts 26. And all you got to do is consider, I want Acts 26, I want also 1 Timothy. Now, let's say that God sent Charles Manson to you. How does that float your boat? For you that don't know Charles Manson, he's a killer. He's a cold-blooded killer. He had a family of killers. He didn't actually kill his wife. Nah, he, he's a cold-blooded killer, though. He designed them to do it. That's, that was his issue. He, he motivated them to do it because he didn't want to do it himself, coward. Now listen, folks. Let's say God sends Charles Manson to you. You going to believe him? <laughs> God sent a man to Israel and the Gentiles who ought not to win anywhere. Folks, don't you understand when God saved you what He did to you? What were you doing for God? Nothing. Nothing. Folks, that's what this lovely lady realized in her life. All the things I did that I thought would get me there to where I could stand before the Lord and be proud of. 
meant nothing. It was done by me. Salvation ain't done by you. Salvation is of the Lord, the book of Psalms said. It belongs to Him. He can save you or He don't have to save you. He didn't have to save a lot of us in this room if He didn't want to. He already had the plan laid out, and if Romans threw Paul even in that battle, God's got no plan for you whatsoever. And He will not be held accountable for not having that plan. Why? Because He didn't write it. Now watch. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Do you realize that when Jesus died... He died for Saul of Tarsus. And do you know what Saul of Tarsus was? Number one, he said he was ungodly. He included himself. He said he was chief of sinners. He included himself. And he said he was an enemy because he included himself in the pronoun. So here we got a man that's an ungodly sinner and an enemy walking the road to Damascus, wreaking havoc, looking like an antichrist. Antichipus, something of Rome, was like an antichrist. It was before Christ. He was killing people, killing Jews. Now you got this Saul of Tarsus persecuting them because they believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, raised from the dead, being baptized, and he was after them. He hated Jesus. He hated Peter. He hated the apostles. He hated the mission and the message they had. And they're on the road absolutely doing nothing good. Now, one good thing is he doing? And the Lord appeared to him. Hey, I'm talking to somebody in here. You ain't never had an experience like this. There's a night in my life when the Lord saved me. And I wasn't doing no good. I tried to bargain with him. God don't bargain. So Paul says in verse 13, who was before blasphemer. I'm pretty sure most religions say that's the unpardonable sin. Then they'll go along, well, murder might be. Paul cleared that up in Acts 13. He said, you're justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. That murder included. Made friends, didn't he? Who was before blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious, but obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. Of course he was in unbelief, ignorant. And the grace of our Lord. Folks, I don't know how to go in. In verse 13, ignorantly and unbelief, the message for him has not been presented yet. He's in unbelief of the true message of Peter. I did it ignorantly and unbelief. I don't believe what Peter had to say. But what Peter says ain't going to help me. They done squared off and said, boy, we got to stay away from that guy. He's a killer. He's a persecutor. They don't want to go near him. He's dangerous to the church at Jerusalem. And there's absolutely none of them praying for his salvation. And God appears to him. Anybody have a date in their life? May the 17th, 1984. I know exactly where it was when I trusted the fact I was forgiven. Never would I ask the Lord to forgive me. Never would I try to bargain and say, Lord, did I say it right? I'll call on you again. Lord, I, I trust you saved me. I quit. You know why I quit? Because I'm already forgiven. It's something you have to receive, folks. And you can't receive forgiveness unless it's shown to you. For Romans 10 said, How shall they call on him in whom they not believe? And how shall they believe in him in whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel of what? Peace. Not hell, fire, and brimstone if you don't quit that God will get you. We got saved people in this room and they ain't quit yet. Yes. 
I tried, but you failed. And you see, if it was up to you to always confess, what do you do the ones you forget? Those kind of upset you a little, don't they? Is God holding that against me? Did I remember? Oh, God. What if I go to bed tonight, go to sleep before confessing, and I, I, I get, and it happens. I die. That's no peace. Peace is knowing that God didn't save me because of what I am. He saved me because of what Jesus did. That's peace, folks. I don't have to, I don't have to struggle to get forgiveness. I don't have to struggle to get saved. I don't have to struggle to do anything God did at all. Thank you, Lord. Now watch. But I obtained ignorant, uh, uh, obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. Mercy. Acts 26. Hold on to that, First Timothy. On the road to Damascus, the Lord told him, I've appeared to thee. He tells him he's going to see future visions and revelations. But look at me in verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet. You think Paul just laid there for a while? <laughs> for I stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Do you think he knows the purpose? <laughs> you think he's going, what did he say to me? It's like Joseph Smith had three tablets for the Moron church, uh, Mormon church. And <clears throat> he lost one. Now, I'm going to put a lot of stock in him, ain't you? God gives him three tablets and he loses one. So, I mean, it's in the book. It's in their book. He lost one of the tablets. Holy crap. I'm going to follow that guy. He can't even keep three tablets the Lord gives him. <laughs> I've talked to Mormons about that, and it's like, well, he's sin of God. Oh, God. Keep something, man. Jeez. Acts 26, verse 16, For I stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. All right, what was Paul made? A minister and a, a witness. Both of these things, of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, colon, or a semicolon, delivering thee from who? Who's the people? Jews. From the people and from who? Why would he make the people and the Gentiles mad? Well, I'm pretty sure I read in Acts 13, he said, uh, By this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him you're all justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Wasn't Israel putting stock in the law and keeping of the law? And he's telling right here, you're justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law. But what are you saying? Are you telling us our heritage and all our rules and regulations are not going to do us any good anymore? Yes. You're justified from all things which you could not. Quit giving the sacrifice. Quit doing it. You don't have to. The law is not going to save you. The law is not given to save you. The law is a teacher. And he writes it in the book of Romans. The law will do anything but put wrath on you. It will condemn you. Step back from it. The liberty that's in Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe it. Not work it. Believe it. Don't you understand how the people hated him? And then the Gentiles, in Acts 17, he goes into uh, Athens and whatever, and he tells them all the things. You are so superstitious in the fact that you have this altars, and you have this temples, and God has golden temples made with hands. And he tells them all the things they're doing wrong, and he said, I'm here to declare to you who God is. And they don't like him. And then you see the end of his ministry, all Asia forsook him. Folks, you ain't had nobody forsake you. Maybe your friends, whatever, just don't want to be around you. I'm talking about they forsook him. They don't want nothing to do with him. 
The man that brought them the greatest message ever was. An ungodly sinner in the enemy world. And they forsook him to go back into their religious things they did to please their God. Don't you know, we all worship God in our own different ways. That's what I hear all the time. That's a bunch of crap. God tells you how to worship. God's the Spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. No other way. Now watch. Uh, he said, I appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I what? Oh, my God, we've got an apostle sent to us. Now, let's see what he did in verse 18. If Paul is sent of Jesus, who sent Jesus? Verily, verily, I say to you, whosoever I send, you receive him, you receive me, and if you receive me, you receive him that sent me. Now, I want to answer to God the right way. God never told you to walk an aisle. God never told you to turn from your sins. God never told you to rededicate. God never told you to, to uh, confess your sins. He never told you that. I want to answer God the right way. God, how do you want me to answer? Trust me. I forgave you. I forgave you for Christ's sake. Now watch. So if Paul sent to the Gentiles... What will happen in verse 18, the first comma? So what's the matter with Gentiles? What was the problem with Paul? He was blind. Okay. They open their eyes, turn them from... You know how you don't know the difference between darkness and light? Right? You can't see. You're blind. So I say, I don't understand why they can't get it out of here. They're blind. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God's world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Right? Don't you know? This and someday he will. So the only this, right? What a blessing of God. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Now read this. To open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light. People are invited in here. And we try to show them the light. And they leave mad. Why did they leave mad? They're blind. Who blinded them? The God of this world. What was the will of God? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. That's the will of God. All men to be saved and come to the truth. Why? He born all men. How did he born? Through the blood of Christ. That cross. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish. But unto us, it's the power of God. Some of us say, well, the only church would preach the cross. But they don't preach the cross as terrible forgiveness. They preach the cross, but you have to repent, or you have to dedicate and turn, confess your sins, or say the sinner's prayer. That ain't the cross. What looked foolish of God and weak of God? to let his son die on a curse. And God took that curse for Israel, took their curse away, and took that cross and saved us. He said, the power of Satan unto God. Now, all of verse 18 has to happen before the end of the verse will work. That they may receive what? Oh my gosh, there's a, there's a forgiveness out there. Here's the forgiveness. And this forgiveness is available to all men. But the problem is, it's there.
and has to be removed. The religious blindness of a person has to be removed to see, oh my God, that's mine. That's mine. God wanted me to have that. Yes, Lord, thank you. All the time, you're trying to get it with this. It won't work. Turn to Second Corinthians. Chapter eleven. Look in your life the time you trusted Christ. Did you slap yourself in the face because you've missed the simplicity all these years? It's like God I miss this. I mean, there are people in this room that understand Mrs. Russell's testimony as good as I do. I understand it. Paige understands it. Jean understands it. My wife understands it. Probably several of you understand that you thought you were doing good. But you ain't. Second Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means as a servant beguile thee through his subtlety. Do you think that Satan went into the garden looking like a dragon? He might have had on a suit. They do now. <laughs> it's in the verse, in, in the chapter. His ministers look pretty good. And the bigger their congregation, the more people think it's godly. And the Bible instructs us that gain is not godliness. It is not. Yeah, why don't they read that direction? Why don't they have that in their mind and say, Folks, there's something going on probably wrong here with all these people. Joel Osteen has 65,000 members. And all the time he missed First Timothy 6. Probably not. What's her name? Joyce Myers. She missed reading it. They have to jump over it. They have to leave it alone. All the religions in America have left Colossians 2 alone for years. They have to leave it alone. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink. Respect the holy days, new moons, or Sabbath days. Because you you got to preach on drinking and smoking and cussing and all the other things, or you ain't got nothing to preach on. Unless you, oh my God, you better have to go to the Bible and preach on it. Oh my God, what if I had to get my sermon out of here? What will I do? I mean, I go to the bookstore and get my sermon, and I, I go play golf on Saturday, and then Sunday I give you a 35-minute sermon. And while they're singing, it please God by the foolishness of singing to save them that believe. And I mean, you want me to preach out of this? Oh, well, I have to get a parallel Bible because we need the NIV, the RSV, the, the Bible. We, we need all those Bibles to compare what God is trying to say to us. Trying to say... God says what he means and says it. He don't need our help. I'm impressed, ain't you, that he read the Koran. I'm impressed that he's a liar. Hey, folks, if you can't understand the King James, you sure ain't going to understand the Koran. Or the, the Book of Moron, or... All the books they have out there, the writing of much books is it, it's wearisome reading it. Folks, if you spend the rest of your life in this, you'll be blessed and you'll be filled with the Spirit, but you'll never get it all. You might get a little, and you'll get what God wants you to know, but you ain't going to get it because you know what? God ain't going to give you the glory. He don't share it. He don't share it. Um. Uh, the, the thing about in Second Corinthians, look with me in verse 3 again. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And sorry, later, but he did go to Eve. He did go to Joyce Myers. <laughs> did you hear what I said? Satan went to Joyce Myers. Did he go to Eve? He went to the women preachers. They're his ministers. But they're not 
the ministers of God. Because God said, the man of God, the husband of one wife. Come on, folks. Say, well, I like to listen to them. Well, of course you did, or they wouldn't be there. My words and my thoughts are not yours. Now watch this. So your mind should be corrupted from what? Simplicity of Christ. How simple is it? First Corinthians 15, I'll shut up. First Corinthians 15. Paul probably didn't have any problem receiving this because it's pretty straight out. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, how does a person call on the name of the Lord? How shall they call on him in whom they not believe? And how shall they believe in him in whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Okay, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Was it necessary to preach the gospel of the Corinthians? It says it was. Which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. What he had to say would save them. If you keep remember what I preach in you, unless you have believed in vain, can you believe in vain? Yes, you can. Here's a lady that believed in vain all the years until 2012. And that day in her life, because of simple talk with her daughter, you know how my mama got saved? I came home from a conference. We moved my mother up into Harrison, uh, Arkansas, near her mother. And I moved her in. She wanted to live in a little motor, uh, mobile home next to her mom, take care of her. Mom was 90 then. And I was sitting on the couch with my mother. And I didn't know that my mother would be dead within a month and a half, two months, maybe a little longer. And I sat there and I was talking to her and I began to talk to her about Romans. My mom had confessed that she was saved through the preaching of my brother-in-law or whatever. And I was telling her some things in Romans. And my mother had been a Pentecostal, Baptist, and then supposedly a grace believer. And I was just talking to her about the book of Romans and what Paul was saying to the Romans. And how that for years I didn't understand the book of Romans until I trusted the Lord. And then the, the understanding came to me about the Roman letter. And I looked over there and she closed her eyes and then opened her eyes big as silver dollars. And she looked at me and she said, Jerry, I'm saved by grace. I preached her funeral. She's a member of the body of Christ. She's asleep up there with Mrs. Russell, Papa. I hope my dad is, but I don't know. But it didn't because it didn't tell him. Do you know? What if you're not sure? Then you're like those in Thessalonians that have no hope. Hope is not based on what you did or ever will do. Hope is based on what he did for you. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Simplicity. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. How simple do you want it? Somebody else died for our sins. That means we're not going to die for our sins. He was buried. We'll never be buried. That was not Mrs. Russell we buried. It was her body. Mrs. Russell was absent from the body and present with the Lord, resting, sleeping in the Lord, waiting for the Lord to awake her, which she will not know the difference from the day she went to sleep. Safe and secure, nothing can separate her from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's peace. I appreciate you being here.